It's 27 minutes to 7 and time for Fiction 15. This week's story called After the Ball is the last in the three-part collection called The Adventures of the Downtown Dirty Faces, written by Conal Creedon. It's read by Martina Carroll. Down our street, change comes slowly. So slow, it's undetectable. Undetectable, and yet, like ageing, it's inevitable. Some things never change. And as usual, there was Tommy, standing at the far side of my shop counter, scrounging a free read after death notices in the echo. Outside, the traffic was thick, spluttering its heavy metals. Heavy metals that make their way up to the first floor windows and stick like tear. Through my shop window, I see frustrated drivers facing home, but no move in the traffic. The traffic's a bit of a joke, I look to Tommy in hope of a continuation of conversation. Not know about that, he muttered. I'd say McSweeney Street was asked to nose with ox in Viking times. A car door opened and the driver got out, his car still in traffic but going nowhere, just ticking over. The shop doorbell announced his entry. Fags for me nerves. His eyes scoured the cigarette shelf. Twenty, um, twenty major. He was under pressure. It occurred to me that he had probably been off the fags for a few weeks and that I was witnessing his breakout. The traffic is cat, I said, being sociable. Cat? It's downright diabolical. Warbox Street is always diabolical, said Tommy. A blooming bottleneck, said the driver. He ranted on about two lanes coming into three and then the lights at McSweeney Street, followed by another two lanes or something to that effect. I took his money, gave him his fags and said thanks and sent him on his way. Outside, the traffic had moved a couple of feet up the street. Hardens honked, fists flaked the air, the odd roar of abuse. The cigarette smoker sent into his car apologetically, drove the car that few feet up the street and stopped, still going nowhere, just ticking over. It crossed my mind that Max Sweeney Street might have been asked to know us in the Viking times, but it wasn't always that way. And pointing across the road in the direction of the hotel gate, I turned to Tommy. Would you believe that we played eight-a-side soccer up and down that street without any interference from the traffic? And I wasn't in the dark ages. Well, you wouldn't play picky out there now, he said. And with a flick of the paper, he went back to reading the small ads. I made me way over to the window and looked out at the madness. The stretch of road between the gate into the hotel car park and the gate next to my father's shop was our stadium. The roar of the crowd echoing inside our heads sometimes burst out through our mouths in the event of a goal, foul or a near miss. You'd find us there every day after school, fronting the ball up and down the street, shouting and roaring and red-faced. It's said that there's no life without light. Well, down our street there was no light without life. Even the dullest of street lamps would have a cluster of people. They chatted, sang, shouted, fought, kissed, and then they'd go home. Anyway, it was about quarter past four. Cold smoke filled the air, the sky dark, the street badly lit. About nine of us had gathered like moths around the lamp, standing, sitting, shoving. Someone go over to his house and get the ball. I stood up from the curb as if to go home. There's no way his man will give the ball out without Georgie. Will someone go over to his house and get Georgie, so? Hang on, I think I sees him. There he is, that's him. And there Georgie was, over by the blood bank, the ball under his arm. Hey, Georgie, come on, kick in the ball, will I? Georgie could hear us, but he was still out of range. As he crossed the street, it became obvious why he was late. There, trailing behind Georgie, was his baby brother, Pinko. Georgie wasn't talking to Pinko, but Pinko was out to play. Come on, Georgie, cross it in, Bobola. Georgie raised his finger in the air as if judging the wind direction. He walked out onto the street and in one slick swoop, the ball moved from under his arm onto his outstretched left hand. His pace quickening to a trot, ball dropped and without missing a beat he gives it a lash. It shot like a rocket up above the street lamp and vanished into the darkness. Trap it! On the head, chip it in! Lay it on! A quick tap around and the team's picked and the game was on. No. 
There was an uneven number of players that night, so as always, Georgie's kid brother, Pinko, would have to be a floater. A floater? A floater was basically a player whose duty was to even the teams, and in the event of a goal, the floater would have to suffer the shame of changing sides and playing for the losing team. Probably because of his age, or the lack of it, Pinko was a hopeless player, and the fact of the matter was that nobody really wanted him on their team. So night after night, Pinko de Flora would be out for a game. It was pathetic seeing him turn around dejected and play for the losing side while his ex-teammates jumped and howled to the sound of the cop, North Bank or Stratford End. What a way to start life. Always on the losing side. That was our little Pinko, a born loser, out to even the odds. But what he lacked in skill, he certainly made up for in determination. Pinko would spend a whole game running his little heart out without even as much as a smell of the ball, except that is when it went wide, or ricocheting off the footpath and ending up miles off down the street. Pinko was always the one who'd run after it, entering for a touch of the ball. It was coming toward the Angelus, and we were tired and sweaty. The score was 14 all. Ted's man was at the corner, roaring at him to come into his tea. It was time to call it a night. Next goal wins. Up went the shout. The rule was on. The ball was out. The pressure was off. The pressure was on. All men forward. We were playing attack and defence. The next goal was the only goal that mattered. A quick break. A clatter of sparks from quarter irons. Roaring, backward running, tugging, shoving. Whoa! A rocket brings the Stratford end to their toes. Cross it in, cross it in. On their head, Ted. Ted makes a break up the wing, playing the ball off the high footpath. He beats one, he beats two, he shoots. Ah! Sending the keeper full stretch to keep it out of net. The ball is out. Georgie's on the break. Georgie, lay it on, Georgie, lay it on. Georgie. Always the greedy glory hunter. He takes a shot. The ball screws off his boot, clips the footpath, spins in the air, bounces and spins out wide. The keeper leaves it off. Georgie Worst, superstar. He walks like a woman and he wears a bra. Out of nowhere comes Pinko. His little knees thundering like pistons under his sharp pants. His right leg reaches out awkwardly, left knee drawn blood as it scrapes along the ground. Ball makes contact with Pinko's ankle. It rebounds off the footpath and bounces. We all just stood there, rooted, as Pinko tumbled over, flat in his face, with the sheer momentum of his effort. The ball spun and bounced and bounced again. Keeper was caught flat-footed. He can do nothing but watch as the ball bounced beyond him into the goal. Goal! 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 The Stratford end was in all its glory as the world goal echoed from gate to gate across the street and around the stadium. Give him a ball and a yard of grass. Pinko will leave you on your ass. His mouth was ajar, his eyes like saucers. Pinko makes a dash inside the keeper, picks up the ball, raises his right hand in the air and waves to the invisible crowd behind the goal. Ha! He jumps in the air, shaking his little clenched fist. The excitement is at fever pitch. We milled around Pinko, hugging and cheering. Georgie comes up behind his little brother and rubbed his feather-like hair with a father-like pride. Don't you, Pinko boy. Pinko was peaking. Not only was he on the winning side, but he had scored a winning goal. The game was over and he couldn't be sent to the losing team. He, Pinko, had won the match. Pinko, ball in hand, was on a lap of honour as the rest of us made our way to the gate for our jackets and jumpers. This was the best moment of his life. Pinko would talk about this goal for weeks. All he wanted to do was go home and tell his dad. Pinko would remember this moment till the day he die. Don't you, Pinko boy? Sorted, Georgie, sorted. Pinko gives a thumbs up and retraces his lap of honour across the street. To the screech of brakes we turned. It was like slow motion, colour draining from the lorry driver's face. His body rigid, foot jammed to the brake, truck skidding along battered pavement to a halt. 
we could do nothing but watch, horrified. And as the rear wheels spewed out smoke from burning rubber, we just stood there rooted. Ted's man back on the street. Call an ambulance for God's sake, will someone call an ambulance, she roared. Driver jumped from the cab, arms outstretched. I didn't see him, he just came out of nowhere, I never saw him. And we just stood there, all eyes dragged, screaming to that place of carnage. That's when Pinko appeared from out behind the truck, ball in hand and arm in the air. Can't get me, na 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 na, can't get me. Georgie ran to his little brother, tears in his eyes. Pinko was raised shoulder high, carried down the street. Hey, where do you think you're going? The celebrations were cut short by Ted's mam. Get home, Ted, this instant. And you, you little scut, you should have had more sense. She shook the living daylights out of Georgie. He could have been killed stone dead there, you idiot. What are you? She then grabbed Pinko by the scruff of the neck and frog marched him home. That was the last game of soccer on McSweeney Street. Georgie's family moved out the street not long after that. You couldn't raise children in a place like this, she said. And of the nine other boys there that day, only one still lives on our street, and that's me. I can't remember some of the names or faces of the lads who played back then, but I do remember that day vividly. It was the day we lost the game. It was the day street soccer became a thing of the past. The day Pinko scored the winning goal. It was dusky outside. The traffic had moved on another few feet. Tommy folded his echo as neat as he could and placed it back under the pile on the counter. It was almost six o'clock. He was heading home to catch the news on the telly. Just reading that they're going to pedestrianise the street, he said. The street? Yeah, Maxweeney Street. Seemingly the planners want to attract families back to live in the city centre. Tommy went on about a new link road and the traffic going up the quays. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? He said. Nice to have the place pedestrianised. It crossed my mind that this place was pedestrianised long before there was traffic on it. But I just said, You're right, Tammy. It'd be lovely. A few flower pots, plastic chairs, that sort of stuff. Tommy shoved his sandwich box inside his coat and headed off into the dark. Home to his gas coal effect fire and telly. I watched him cross the street, weave in and out of the traffic and pass over beyond the corner, over by Pinko's house. I knew. Pedestrianisation or not, football would never be played on our street again. Not only because of the traffic, but because the families have moved out, out to the corporation reservations on the north side, out of the heart of the city. I remember the day Pinko played a blinder. It was the day street soccer became a thing of the past. It was the day the traffic won the game and the heart of a city stopped beating. After the Ball was read by Martina Carroll. It was the third and final part of the adventures of the Dirty Downtown Faces, written by Connell Creedon. Fiction 15 is produced in Cork by Aidan Stanley.